I heard somebody say five more seconds. Uh, closing the doors at two o'clock sharp. Is that right? <laughs> All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. We are at 2.03, so we're going to get started. Um, we are, and happy Friday. My name is Esteban Duran Ballon. I'm the Director of Clinical Services and the Administrator of the NRC. Uh, so we're here for the Levels of Care discussion. So uh, can everybody hear me? Is this working okay? All right, good. So we have a, a panel here of experts today. So we're going to uh, hear from a few of us today, and we're going to have a great discussion uh, about uh, the different levels of care and how it works here at Brandon Oaks, uh, and, and just uh, just some inf general information, and hopefully we'll get to answer a lot of the questions that we've received. So uh, we've had uh, several weeks to submit questions, so many of you have submitted questions to to Beth, so thank you for that. Uh, we have that list of questions here, and we've, uh, we have some, a few notes for the answers. So our plan here is to uh, Go one question at a time. I'll be the one asking the questions, and then we'll be answering it as a panel. And then, uh, you know, if there's a specific question about that topic, please raise your hand. We'll make sure that we answer everything completely. But we do have a full list, so um, you know, we, we will get to it uh, probably if, if we just uh, go through the questions at the end of it. So um, there's two things that I want to say before we get started. And Ben kind of prefaced this a little bit in the the town hall this this morning. So um, uh, the the first is. We're going to be talking here as a group, and we're not going to be talking about individual cases uh, in, or individual resident cases or any. No, so we're not going to be giving anybody's names, and I would rather not get into the conversation of, oh, I saw this person do this and this person got away with that. I don't think that's productive uh, use for everybody's times here, and I think it doesn't uh, lead to a good discussion. So, um, if if we can help with general questions, that's what we're going to be doing here today: general answers. Um, but we'll go from there. The other thing is that I want to remind you that every case is different, every situation is different. So a lot of the a lot of the questions that we have will have very specific answers. A lot of them are very uh, general answers and kind of things we do in, in, in most of the situations and things uh, may apply a little differently every time. So 
uh, just because you may think of something different, it doesn't mean that that's always the case. So uh, it will be more clear as we, as we go through the questions. So, um, and then lastly, if you do want to talk to us at the end, we'll be happy to stay here and field individual questions. That's the time to talk about uh, any specific person or anybody uh, or, or any particular situation. But even if it's not today, you can make an appointment with us or catch us after the meeting. We'll be happy to answer those questions. But um, So what we're going to do first is the, the introduction of the panel. Uh, and uh, we are just going to go around, let everybody say their name, uh, what's their role here uh, at Brandon Oaks, and tell us a little bit about what their department does. Uh, and, then, uh, and then maybe... I won't put him on the spot too much because I didn't give him any, any warning ahead of this, but can tell us something interesting about yourself or something you want to share with the group, okay? There won't be any singing required, Jessica, or, <laughs> or any acting, but uh, I think it's good to share a little bit, something personal or something unique. Hello. You all know me. I'm Beth Herndon, Resident Services Director. Um, I kind of handle all kinds of things from parking stickers, lost keys, billing, meal plan questions, um, kind of anything you need, you come to me, and if I can't answer it or fix your problem, then I send you to the person who can. Um, I'm also in charge of transportation, so I help out with that. Um, and I guess I, I had to ask Teresa like a fun fact about me, and she actually had a few, so I'll share a few. So I like to name my dogs after humans. So like my dog right now, his name is Carl, and he's awesome. He's a puppy, he's, he's a mess, but we love him. Um, I was on the Brandon Oaks softball team this year. I played third base and I taught myself to crochet and I'm actually pretty good now. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Meg Caruso. I'm the administrator for Brandon Oaks at home. So we are the home health. Um, so we have home health, which would include uh, traditional nursing therapy, um, and we also have home care, which we'll get into a little bit um, later, which involves uh, caregivers. Um, I'm new here, so I think I'm starting to get to know some of you, but I've been here since May. Um, something interesting, every morning I have to do, in a particular order, I do the New York Times mini crossword puzzle, followed by Wordle, followed by Connections, then by Sudoku and strands. And it has to be in that order. And if I can get my Sudoku puzzle in under three minutes, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> Hello. I'm Good now? There we go. Cameron Blunt, I'm the rehab director for inpatient rehab over at the NRC and the outpatient clinics here at the Independent Living Building and for the community as well. Um, I've been a PT for almost 22 years. Um, this is my second stint here, so glad to be back. This is a great looking crowd out here. So, uh, Something interesting about me, I have three boys. Um, most of them play travel sports and I play uh, adult league hockey, uh, which is entertaining. So. Um, <laughs> I'm not the best, but it's fun. Hi, I am Jessica White. I'm the administrator in our assisted living here. Um, so basically, I oversee the operation of assisted living and make sure that we're following our regulations and doing everything we're supposed to do and providing great care. Um, oh, I don't know what to tell you about myself. Um, I guess... My like creative outlet is that I own an online boutique. Um, so I like clothes and like kids clothing and fashion. So um, yeah, that's like my creative outlet. Howdy, this is Nathan Winston. I am the community relations director over at the NRC. So I am your guide when it comes to post-acute rehab, long-term care or memory support. Of course, Esteban, he's a friendly person. He's always a good go-to. But whenever you guys need any assistance, potentially with a higher level of care, I can help be the bridge to help you with that process. A fun fact about me, I have a lot I could share, but I will tell you that I have a twin brother, and he we're fraternal twins. So he uh, unfortunately didn't get all the looks like me. But <laughs> And then, I, you know, I am a... 
Hello? I am a big family guy as well, and I have four young kids. So I was telling people earlier, if you guys need any candy, let me know. I'll be happy to bring some in and share with everybody. We also, can you hear me now? All right, we'll figure it out. Thank you. We also have Janice Slau uh, here with us, so you can stand up and wave. Janice is uh, our Director of Social Services at the NRC. She's not up on the panel right now, she doesn't have any specific questions, but she's our phone a friend in case we uh, get in trouble here and need some help. Uh, so thank you for the support. And, and of course, we have Ben Burks in the back. Everybody knows Ben. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so thank you for, for that uh, introductions. And uh, we'll, we're going to start with, uh, I think, what uh, quoting Ben, I think, is that, what does he say? That swallowing the frog or step, is swallowing the frog, is that the saying? Start out with the hardest question. Eat the frog. Eat the frog. The, the, we received several questions, but of course, the number one question, and we, we know this, is, is who decides uh, when a level of care change is needed. Uh, I wish that was a simple answer, and I wish it was just a one word, and we can move on to the next. Uh, but it's not. So I want to take a couple steps back first and want to talk about the, uh, the financial model of Brandon Oaks. I know you all had a meeting yesterday about this, and, and, and there was a lot of good information at that meeting. But I want to explain a few things before so we understand where the, the staff and, and Brandon Oaks is a, itself. So as a life care, as a lifetime, I'm sorry, a life care member here, as a Brandon Oaks uh, life care member, you come in, you pay your monthly fee that minus the adjustments every year for inflation, that's what you discuss on Thursday, it stays the same, regardless of your level of care. So you pay the same amount as your base, there's other things we're gonna go into more detail, regardless of where you are. So if you're an independent living, if you're an assisted living, if you're in a nursing and rehab center, your base fee is the same. So what that means is that the revenue side of the business stays constant per resident, regardless of where you are. Now, if you know about assisted living and nursing care, it's expensive. And the major, major expense by far is labor, is the staffing a part of it too. And as, you, as the progression goes on for the levels of care, so does the cost. So the, the cost that is associated with staying in assisted living is much higher than it is in independent living. And it is much higher in the nursing center than it is in assisted living as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, basic, Finance 101, or it's just revenue minus expenses. It's financially beneficial for Brandon Oaks for you to stay in independent living longer. And I think that's also in your best interest. That's what we all want. That's what everybody wants. So we, it's not just because it's the right thing to do, that's we like to see you here. I'd love for you to come visit us across the street at the NRC, but not to stay. We really are trying really hard not to stay there. Um, it, just be, again, because we want to see you healthy. But there's also a financial incentive. And I think it's important to talk about that because there's, there's a myth and there's other institutions, the majority of other institutions out there are, don't have this financial model. They charge you more when you go to a higher level of care. So there could be a perverse incentive there to move you along so that we can get more money. Uh, so that's not the case uh, in, that, in here. Uh, another incentive with that is that when we if, if there are more Brandon Oaks residents in the NRC or in assisted living occupying those beds, that is less best for us to admit from the outside. So when we admit from the outside, those are non-Brandon Oaks, non-life care residents, when they come in from the outside, they pay the full price. You'll pay a discounted price at, at, at that rate, at the daily, uh, the daily fee compared to what we have from, from, from the outside community. So the more we keep independent living residents out of the NRC, out of the assisted living, we can admit those people from the outside at a higher rate. Uh, and, and so again, another win-win, uh, I think it aligns our uh, financial incentives uh, well. So uh, then the next part is the level, uh, any questions on that? We're gonna talk about the specific, what cover, what's covered in the NRC, what's covered in the NAL here in a little bit. Y you'll have the criteria for levels of care document in your handbook. Uh, and hopefully everybody had a chance to review it. Yours is whole punch, mine's not yet. <laughs> that was, um, we, we are not gonna go through this page by page and read it. You, you can do that and hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Uh, referring back to the point I made earlier, this is, these are general guidelines. This is not, 
100% every single time, and it's really hard to capture everything into, into this document in writing. So this is a guideline that we use to discuss and to see where each individual is and where they, they should be. So everybody starts in an independent living that's a life care uh, member, um, a, a life care resident. Uh, it, we only admit from the outside to assisted living uh, or memory care or long-term care we have availability. We don't right now, but uh, that's, that everybody else would be uh, life care. So they start in independent living. And you know, if, if we go to the first one, right, just as an example, must be able to feed self. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to prepare all your meals. It doesn't mean it, it, there's a lot of th questions that come up with that. Uh, but it does mean you need to be able to feed yourself. Uh, and so if you go to assisted living, you're going to have a little more supervision, assistance, and so on as, as you move to that continuum of care. Uh, and then, um, so the question is, if we have an individual case, we work on an individual resident, that it may be an independent living, and we starting to see a decline or change in the status. You start, you need more help, you're having some falls, you need help with feeding, anything like that. We do have, we do meet once a week, a lot of us that are here on this table and a few others. Uh, it is staff only. I know this has come up before. It's like, why, is there, why are the residents not involved in this conversation? That's when we, because we talk about all of our residents, and it really is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the primary purpose of that is what can we do to keep you independent? That is the purpose for, for that meeting. What can we do to keep you in assisted living if you're already there? And then what can we do to, you know, to make sure that you're, you're still safe wherever you may be um, in that area? Now, the definition of what is independent living, it is, you know, you're not supposed to use the word itself in definition, but is you have to be independent. Uh, so uh, you have to be able to do things on your own. Now, that doesn't mean that you may have an assisted device, you may have motorized assistance, you may have a boot, like I do right now. <laughs> you know, things come up on a temporary basis, and you may need some help from time to time, and that's, that's fine. Well, we did, well, but when you, if somebody depends on help or something like that, 24-7, or it is a full necessity for you to stay independent living, that's where the question may come up that you may need to move. Um, the decision is not made by this panel, by the, or by, by the group that we have alone. This panel discusses what information we have. And what is, and Ben mentioned it this morning too, when we have a physician uh, or, or a group of physicians or different physicians saying, this person needs a different level of care, our hands are tied. In that sense, we have to do that. Um, we doesn't mean we have to do it today. We can work with the physicians. There's a lot of wiggle room in that area. But when we have something in writing, we have to say, that says this person may need to move or we need to stay. Uh, our options are a little more, more limited in that, in that area. Um, the, any questions on that? That's, that? that's a tough one. I knew there were going to be some questions. So let's start over here. So, what are you all doing to the people? So, yeah, we, this, like I said before, this is a general guide. It doesn't mean that it's uh, like this every single time. Um, can you hear me? Repeat the question. Okay, sorry. So I, I guess the, I'm not sure if it was a specific question or a statement about uh, complaints about how this levels of care document is, uh, is very subjective and not objective or, or you know. And, and I guess I just, I just I want to emphasize this is we don't use this document. We don't pull it out and mark on a matrix who is where, and this is what the algorithm determines that where you are. 
we, you know, we rely on everybody's relationships and uh, the communication that we have here uh, with, you know, with Beth, with, with Carter, with dining services, with everybody else to inform us where you are and what help you may need uh, to, to be able to, to stay independent. But again, our objective is to stay independent. So we have um, this guideline is just a general as a starting point. It, it really is a starting point to it. And if it was as easy as following this, it would, it would make our lives easier too. You know, you, you check those boxes and you, you have to move on. Uh, but but it's, it, it's not. And uh, a lot of it is uh, just a general idea to where to start, but you may check what box here on this one place, but you have help from your spouse. You have help from a caregiver. You have help from other areas that allow you to stay independent. And to be honest, we prefer that. Uh, that that's, that's our preference. What, what we, when we, when we get into trouble is that if you are relying on so many of these other factors outside to stay independent, and one of those, one of those factors may fail or come through, fall through, uh, that's, that's when it may be come into question to that. So the decision, you know, the, there's two ways that I think of the, the levels of care change. One of them, something critical, urgent happens, you go to the hospital, you come back to the NRC, and now you're there and then suddenly something had like a stroke or a fall or something like that that may have changed what you were drastically from one day to the other. And then uh, another one's the, the gradual decline. That was a more challenging one. Uh, and that, that's where we have a lot more discussions and talks about how we're gonna progress this over time. So um, the discussion involves the residents, the families, the physicians. Uh, there's multiple physicians in many cases. So sometimes we have a medical director, in-house doctor, at the NRC that sees the patient every day uh, versus a specialist that may go out and see the person for one particular area uh, and, and, and they'll kind of combine a little bit. So, yes. Hey, I think it's okay. Okay. One of the reasons why I'm here is not because of independent living, living but because we do have assisted and everything available across the street. Um, Let's say I get to the point where I start to struggle with my medications, I'm having trouble dressing, whatever, and I see that I need more help. What is my next step? Do I come and talk to Brandon Oaks folks, or do I need to talk to my doctor to get some kind of medical directive? So if it's going to be assisted living, kind of, we'll just focus on assisted living if that's kind of where you're at. Um, so you can really be doing those things simultaneously. So you are going to need your physician. You're going to need to go see your physician um, and you know have an exam done or an evaluation done or just meet with them because we do have paperwork that has to be completed by your physician and you have to see them no more than 30 days prior to your admission to assisted living. But you could also come and talk to me and just you know let me know what's going on or talk to really anybody. But if you're coming to assisted living, it might make more sense to come straight to me. But you can um, reach out to any of us to just express your concerns and what's going on, um, what you're seeing, what's happening, and you know, just to echo what's already been said, we're gonna work with you to see if maybe we can implement some things to keep you in independent living. So if you're just having some trouble with your medications, you know we have um, aides that can come in from Brandon Oaks at Home to help set up, like med, do med management to set up your medications. And maybe that could keep you in independent living a little bit longer. So we'll kind of work through those things first. Um, and if we then have said, okay, we do think assisted living is the appropriate next step, then we're just gonna be working together simultaneously. So with your physician, with you, we're all working together to make that happen. Okay, there we go. Thank you, there's really no wrong answer. Anybody here on this panel, uh, anybody, any of the management here, if you need to get started, we all work together, we'll help you navigate that. Your clinic nurse is probably your best resource for that, that to, to, to start out, uh, starting directing that, that additional help. Thank you. All right, so we're probably gonna come back to a lot of these questions, but I wanna make sure that we answer some of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So um, we're gonna move into a little bit of the, uh, the financial part of it, of the fees associated with some of this move. So 
I'm gonna ask Beth. One of the questions here says, does my, does my monthly service fee change if I stay in independent living and my spouse moves to a higher level of care? So the answer to that question is no, it does not change. Um, when we're specifically talking about the monthly service fee, it doesn't change. Now, there are additional charges, which we'll get into in a little while, but your monthly service fee will not change. So you can stay in independent living, your spouse can go to assisted living, memory care, um, long-term care, it doesn't matter. It's gonna stay the same. And one of the questions with that too was if, uh, if there's a couple and they wanna occupy two separate rooms in either assisted living or the NRC, does that, does that change the fee? The answer again is no, it doesn't. So it doesn't happen very often that we have um, couples that transition to a higher level of care together that don't want to stay together. But if that's the case, if you all need two separate rooms, you can have two separate rooms and pay the same monthly service fee. All right, and what about the additional charges at the higher level of care? To Beth again. <laughs> Um, so additional charges, um, legally, when you're in a higher level of care, we have to provide three meals a day. So one meal is $7, so you're going to pay an additional $14 a day for meals. Whether you eat those meals or not, you're still going to have to pay for them. Who wants to take medical supplies? I mean, do you want me to take all these? Okay, this is fine. <laughs> um, there will be, there could be some charges for medical supplies. Uh, you know, bandages and things like that, of course, are covered. Uh, but if you have a specialty wound or something uh, different, there could be some charges for, uh, for that, uh, something's not covered by Medicare. We also, uh, if we do your laundry, it is $60 a month uh, for as many times as needed, we will do the laundry. Uh, and then the pharmacy, that could be the, the big one. The pharmacy would typically go through your insurance. Uh, at that care, at that level, at, at a different level of care, or if you're paying privately for that, depends on everybody's individual plan. So, anything to add for charges, or any questions about charges? Yeah. Sorry. I've heard, excuse me, I've heard that when you go up to the next next level, you're not in charge of your medications as to where they come from. So if we have ours sent to our home through a mail order, does that get changed or can we continue that? Because it's cheaper coming to our home than it would be for you all to get my medicines. So there's two answers for that. I'm gonna let Jessica answer what happens in assisted living first and then I'll tell you the NRC. So we have a pharmacy that we partner with. Um, it's the same pharmacy at NRC and memory care as well. Um, so we do use them to get our medications for our residents because we do manage the medications. Now you always have a choice. Um, so you can choose another pharmacy if you wanted to, but just typically that is where we get most of the medications for our residents. So you can continue to get mail order and have those shipped in and we can you know, have those repackaged um, and utilize those medications uh, in assisted living. <laughs> All right, if you are in short-term rehab, you don't have to pay for your medications. At that point, the facility pays for, the, for your medications. If you're in long-term care, the NRC, at, at a different level of care, uh, yeah, the same answer as assisted living would be the case. There is a repackaging fee uh, because we want to make sure that all the medication looks the same because if, get, if everybody gets it from different places, the packaging looks different, you have the same nurse giving out six, seven different types of medication packages, that could cause a lot of med errors. So there is a repackaging fee, so everything's packaged the same way if you do choose to use your own pharmacy. All right, next question is, who pays for the move? <laughs> um, so the resident is responsible for um, payment of the moving company. So we can help, I can help coordinate the move, I can help schedule it for you, but the resident is the person who pays for the move. So number, the next question is, will I have a storage unit in assisted living or the NRC? So the answer is no. When you move out of independent living, your storage unit stays and you go. 
Um, but again, <laughs> sorry, that sounded bad. I didn't mean it like that. Um, but again, uh, I, there's storage companies out there that I can help facilitate and, and get something for you. Again, if it's, you know, if it's outside of uh, Brandon Oaks here, then you're going to be financially responsible for it, but I can help coordinate that. Hey, the next question is for Beth as well. <laughs> but do I have to keep paying for my apartment, my monthly service fee, when I'm in rehab temporarily covered by Medicare? So yes, even though you're not living in your apartment at the time, you are still going to continue to pay um, your monthly s service fee for that apartment. Um, you're, not, you're not paying for your apartment and a room across the street, you're just paying for your apartment still. All right. The next question is about uh, long-term care insurance, but I wanna make sure we answer any questions about fees and charges when we're in different levels of care. Any questions? All right, well, many of you may have a long-term care insurance plan, and there's multiple products on this, so um, if you have one, Jessica, <laughs> would that help me pay for my stay at the AL or the NRC here, Brendan Oaks? Well, it depends on what your policy says. For the most part, most of them do start paying when you have reached uh, the assisted living level of care. Again, though, you have to check with your specific policy. Um, but yes, and how to do that is when you move to assisted living, you would in call the insurance company and initiate a claim. They will then reach out to me to request all of the documentation that they need to basically prove that you need the amount of assistance that they require in order to start paying for the services but then you continue to pay your monthly bill just like you do now, and then you are reimbursed by your long-term care insurance company. So they don't pay us directly, they're gonna essentially pay you back. Um, but once you initiate that claim, most of it is actually handled by me, and then Lisa Tucker does it for um, the NRC and for memory care. She takes care of all of it for, for those levels of care. I feel like it stops there, there we go. Just takes a second, it's a little slow. Um, so we're gonna switch gears for a second now. We're gonna, some of the questions we got was about home health and outpatient therapy. So we have here the experts for that. We're just gonna ask them, what is the difference between home health and outpatient therapy? And then we can talk about home health and home care as well with that. So, so all right, there we go, oh, all right. Um, again, my name's Cameron. I'm the director of rehab for the outpatient clinic and the NRC. So the, our outpatient clinic is right around the corner. We have all therapies there, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Um, you come to us. Uh, you get a doctor's referral. We can assist you in getting that referral. Um, come talk to us. We can help you get through that process. Um, the main difference, and I'll let Meg you know, talk about home health. It, uh, the outpatient is you come to us for your treatment services. Um, trying to think anything else other than, but we offer all three disciplines. Like the yeah, yeah, yeah. So as long as you have a doctor's referral for outpatient therapy, we'll see you in the clinic right around the corner. Feel free to stop by, ask any questions, stop the therapist in the hallway if you see them. Call me. I'll be happy to help you get through any of this stuff. I just the my main point is for you guys to know the services are here for you. It's important to know that we're here, um, like Esteban said, to help uh, keep you an independent living. We'd love to work with you, so feel free to stop by and and see us. And I'll let Meg talk about home health. Sure. Um, again, I'm Meg, and I'm the administrator of Brandon Oaks at Home, the home health. Um, I guess the big difference between outpatient and home health is that we do therapy or nursing in your home or wherever that may be. So we don't only serve the Brandon Oaks community, we also serve the community at large. So our therapists and nurses travel all over the valley um, to serve um, and provide care. Um, another difference between outpatient and home health is the requirements. So home health is a little more stringent as far as what is um, required to be eligible for home care services. So like outpatient, you still need an order from your physician, um, but they're a little pickier. They want us to have what's called a face-to-face, -face, which is a 
face-to-face -face visit with your physician, and we have certain criteria. It has to be uh, within 90 days prior to when you start home health or 30 days after. Um, so typically, we would maybe see more people that have had a recent hospitalization or a recent surgery. Um, that's often what prompts us to um, begin services, but that's not always the case. Sometimes someone's having a decline at home um, and they see their physician for knee pain or back pain or they're falling and they may um, initiate the process as well. Um, they, you also have to have what's a qualifying diagnosis, which most of the time that's not too hard um, to get from your physician. Um, and then what makes us different too is you have to be what's considered homebound. Um, you could go into the ins and outs of that, but I think the easiest way that I can explain it to people is that um, who here has heard of Rosie's off-track betting? <laughs> if you can go out and do your Rosie's off-track betting, you're probably not homebound. Um, if I'm calling you and I can't find you to make an appointment, you're probably not homebound. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't ever leave your home. It doesn't mean that you can't go out to your doctor's appointments and those kinds of things. But it's usually for someone that it's a difficult taxing effort for you to get out of your home. So again, like if you had a surgery, maybe initially that's, that's tough for you. Hopefully we get you back to walking down to your meals again and we can transition you over to Cameron to do outpatient therapy. Um, again, we have physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and skilled nursing. And we have to be able to provide a skill, meaning something that only us can um, provide. And once we teach you how to do what you can do on your own, then um, insurance or Medicare says, okay, you're good to go. Um, Medicare does cover 100% of our services as long as it's skilled and medically necessary. Um, we do take some other insurance, some, um, some Anthem, some uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield um, plans, but they often have limited number of visits, um, or you may have a copay or a deductible that goes along with that. Can you talk about home health and home care? Yes, okay. So the difference between home, oh, yes. If I have a temporary, if I if I have a temporary condition, say I've been going to uh, PT here, I have a temporary condition that limits my mobility, and I can't get down the hall, mm -hmm. and I need to continue my PT. Do you guys fight it out? And it takes two weeks for me to get my PT going. Cameron and I do feats of strength out in the parking lot. <laughs> Yeah, you just need to get, we just have to get the criteria that we need. So if a physician, a face-to-face -face visit if we need to transition you over. And so was, we would work together to help you get that. Yes. I'm coming, I'm She's coming. coming. I'm not. <laughs> Sore from all my trick-or-treating. I've, I've got a little bit of experience with this from my own professional uh, time doing home health and, and doing uh, some uh, inpatient and outpatient uh, therapy, and I've worked with all, all of the disciplines. Uh, <clears throat> when I was doing home health, the criteria was homebound, and you were allowed to, to leave your home for three reasons. Go see your doctor, go see your hairdresser, <laughs> or go to church. <laughs> now, if you were going to go down to Hardy's to have a hamburger, mm -hmm. or go to the grocery store, that's not home health, okay? Maybe in Brandon Oaks, you know, this whole area is your home. Sure. So if you wander down to the dining room, maybe that is, you know, acceptable. But you're supposed to be homebound to, to do home health. Otherwise, it's outpatient. And that's a good point. This entire campus is your, you know, is your home, right? So we have a little bit of flexibility there. I was curious, some of the residents have aides that come in and help them with certain things. Is that in your ballpark or is that some outside group? Yes, perfect segue, thank you. So that's the next question is, what is the difference between home health and home care? So if you think of, we'll just use the, the root words there, home health, think 
health, like um, medically, medical health, think home care, think caregivers. So home health is our, our skilled services, PT, OT, speech, nursing. Home care, we have caregivers that can provide non-skilled care. So we have CNAs that can help um, with um, your example of bathing or dressing, you start having difficulty with that or um, you need assistance going sorting through your mail um, and uh, keeping track with things like that. Um, maybe you need help with pet care. Uh, maybe you need assistance running errands. Um, they can do a whole gamut of things to help you stay in your home. The difference there is that you don't need a doctor's order for that. Um, that's it's private pay, so you can pay for that. You pay for that out of pocket, like. Um, Jessica said with the long-term care policy, some people do use their long-term care policy to pay for home care services. Um, in similar fashion, you would, we would bill you, you would get an invoice, and then you would submit that yourself, depending on your policy, if that's something that was covered. Um, I suppose that's the biggest difference, is that it's not covered by insurance, um, and it's not considered skilled. What other questions do you have? And I'm sorry for the panel here. I'm going to jump back and forth a little bit from our questions, but I think the next question follows with this. If a spouse is the primary caregiver for the resident and the spouse needs to travel, needs to go out of town, is unavailable for whatever reason, is it possible to hire a short-term, 24-hour caregiver in their, in their absence? Meg? Yes. Yes, the answer is yes. So our home, uh, home care caregivers, we do not currently provide after hours or weekend care. You are more than welcome to use an outside agency to hire to provide those services. Um, I do have names and lists of people, and I'm happy to help also coordinate and call. There are some local agencies that will can guarantee getting you on their services within 24 hours if you ha are in an emergency situation. Um, so I can happy to help coordinate that if we need to. Um, but those are not services that our home health aides are able to provide after hours or overnight care. So, so an independent. Like one Mississippi to Mississippi. All right. So in independent living, can I hire a caregiver that is not a Brandon Oaks? You answered that question. I can hire somebody from the outside. Can I hire a friend or somebody like that is not through an agency? And would you recommend that and when? Well, I would recommend first that you come to us. <laughs> but um, if there was an availability or we couldn't meet those needs, you're absolutely, or of course, are welcome to hire an outside agency. You could hire um, an individual, but we definitely recommend that you go with an agency that has um, that is licensed and bonded and insured, um, just for your protection, um, to make sure that you're getting quality services. All right. Any questions for home health? Therapy, Ben in the back. Yes. Okay. So the question from the gentleman in the back is that uh, <laughs> if the to clarify the 24-hour, the short-term help for caregivers. Uh, so that would be that's back to the question, the initial question, right? About what's independent living. So if you require 24-hour caregiver assistance, that is not truly independent living. And uh, we work with staffing and nursing all the time. We know how it is. If you depend on somebody showing up to work that day and they don't show up and you're in trouble, that's not independent living. So I think so. just because you have a reliable caregiver doesn't mean that they can't get a flat tire on the way to work if something happens like that in their short time. So that, that's why we are uh, making that point about that the 24 hours is a, a short-term situation that may help you go through something, um, a particular situation, but that's not a long-term solution. That, that's not something that, that you can use as a, something to rely on to stay independent living. Does that make sense? Yes, and there's another question back there. So. He's got the microphone. Just one. Yep. 
if a family member is your caretaker, does that affect uh, Medicare? Does Medicare pay for family members to be the caretaker? Medicare does not pay for family givers to be. That's what I, I had heard, but I wasn't sure because they're doing the same job, but they don't get paid for it, right? Okay. Okay. Well, if you think of something else, let us know. But I'm going to turn over to Nathan now and, and talk about what happens if you're an independent living resident and you have a medical emergency or something happens that you need to go to the hospital. So talk us through a few different scenarios and kind of what that looks like and what advantages you have as a, as a Brandon Oaks resident in that case. So it's, you know, everyone's different. It's not a one shoe fits all situation. So sometimes when you go to the hospital, they may just do an evaluation and feel that, hey, you're good to go. Maybe we can set you up with home health services. So you'll typically see a social worker, potentially a case manager, in that situation, if your observation, they feel that you're safe to go home, and they're going to try to bridge you with our home health or your choice. Um, you guys have so many advantages being life care members, um, you know, but Brandon Oaks, we're always going to guarantee, you know, for the nursing and rehab center, you're always going to have guaranteed placement if you need it. So going back to the observation, if you're safe, they feel that you're stable and able to discharge back home with some support but homebound is appropriate they're going to set you up with home health services sometimes they'll keep you in the hospital and you'll only be observation but they want you to stay a little bit longer to monitor to make sure that you're stable in that situation sometimes you can you know get a have some debility from being in the bed not being up moving around things like that so in that situation they'll probably get therapy to work with you to see what type of assistance you need when you're ready to discharge and go back home. That could be a situation where they do try to bridge you to the rehab center. And then in that situation, you would let them know, hey, I'm a life care member. Let's go ahead and send my information to Brandon Oaks. That way, you know, we'll be, I'll be able to come and help and answer any questions. And I'll tell you this, whenever in doubt too, just ask for, you know, your information to be sent to Brandon Oaks. You can ask for Nathan. They know me at the hospitals, and I can come and be an advocate for you guys. Um, again, whatever level of care is most appropriate, that's the direction that we'll try to steer you guys in. Um, but, again, I can be a resource. I'm here to help out, too, and be an advocate on your behalf. And then a lot of times, too, when you have a, an acute illness, injury, something of that nature, and you get that inpatient stay. So a lot of people, um, you know, it just depends on your insurance, of course, but that three-night requirement is needed for your Medicare benefits. When that happens and you do need that post-acute rehab, they will connect you once you let them know that you're a life care member. And then on my end, I'm going to work to make sure I have that room available for you so you can come over and get the rehab that's needed, nursing care that's needed, in order to bridge you guys back home or to the next appropriate level of care. So there's a couple of, you know, different situations, but again, when in doubt, when you're not sure, say, hey, you know, I want Brandon Oaks to be sent my information. That way I can come see you guys in the hospital and be an advocate for you. I will say that, you know, with privacy and HIPAA, just because you're a life care member doesn't give me the automatic right to come and see you at the hospital. You're still entitled to your privacy. So, again, once you give them that permission, that's going to allow me to step in and be able to help out. I have a question for you. Let's say that uh, we have the people living as couples. One in independent living, one is really a caregiver for the other who really needs, actually would be in assisted living or memory care if it was not because they have a permanent caregiver. And let's say that unexpectedly, the caregiver gets hurt, goes to the hospital, and is overnight. 
what service will Brandon Oaks provide now for the other member in the home who needs a caregiver and have no family available at that time to take over? Ben, please go. Please go. Evelyn, that's a great question. The, what I want to make sure you all understand is that if you're in a situation where one of you is a caregiver and the other is depending on you, we need to know that ahead of time and we need to know what your plan is and work with you to create a plan. So we should not have surprises. We do not work very well on surprises. I will tell you, I've called Nathan on a holiday on a Sunday. I think it was Easter. I, I literally think it was Easter last year when I was working with Nathan. Um, we pull rabbits out of a hat occasionally, um, but we work so much better if we have a, an advanced idea of what's happening, what your plan is for something like that. And oftentimes that plan will include your, your family that's close by, uh, but we need to have what your plan is in place should something like that happen. So if you all are in a situation now where, you have a care, where you're a caregiver uh, and, and someone else uh, needs your care, if you do not have a plan, then please make sure you see somebody on this panel tonight, uh, today, so that we start making that plan for you because we have to have a plan in place. Should, just like what Evelyn said, the, the caregiver has get sick or uh, has a flat tire and can't get home in time, whatever, we need to make sure that we can have that plan executed. I didn't mean to jump in, but that's what I was going to say before Evelyn brought that up. Thank you. Perfect. Any follow-up questions to that? The associated question with that was if somebody needs a respite level of care, if somebody needs to stay one, two nights at the NRC, do I just call Nathan and get in tonight, or how does that work, Nathan? <laughs> Just a quick follow-up. Uh, ben just uh, suggested that uh, talk to one of you. Who specifically should we talk to to make a plan if we don't have a plan? The, the clinic nurse is pretty much the first one. Is that is that okay? And second, I would say Beth, resident services and, and independent living. I'm not trying to jump on Esteban's toes. Or no, please. Toes. That's fine. You, okay. you can have it. <laughs> No, thank you. Yeah, and like, uh, like as we said earlier, we really work well as a team. So if you come to the wrong person, we'll figure it out from there. So we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. Is there still another question? Sorry, I can't see everybody's hands back there. Could you all speak to? Um, rehabilitation and time frames on when you would make a decision of changing someone. Um, let's say they're continuing to progress. How long do they have in rehabilitation if they're continuing to progress? So I'll start and then I'm sure there'll be others to contribute with that too. So I'll start with the regular, the Medicare guidelines uh, for that. Uh, so Medicare typically pays up to 100 days. Uh, but you, you all heard me share in the town hall meetings in the morning, our average length of stay is 30 days. That's really a better number to use than the 100 days. Getting to 100 days is incredibly rare nowadays because there is certain criteria that needs to be met to show that you're making progress, that you're continuing to work towards your prior level of function. Um, and, and I'm gonna rely on Cameron to help answer this question too. But 30 days, I would say, is the average, if we want, if we want to use a number as an average to that of when people are making progress to, to stay kind of, all right, we, we know where this is going to be heading to. Uh, we, we, can, we can kind of see where, where, what's going to be the final outcome. No, no. Um, from the therapy standpoint, there is, everybody's different, so it progresses at a different speed. So there's no specific time or frame or anything. It just depends on how how the patient's progressing uh, if they're as long as they're benefiting from the skilled service of the therapy then it's justified there's no average length or any yeah yeah as long in therapy they're they're allowed to 
uh, receive therapy services covered under their Medicare Part B benefit, even if their, their uh, stay is paid for uh, under their life care benefit. The therapy services is being paid for by their, their uh, Medicare Part B, so they have, they have the same regulations. It's, are they, is it medically necessary and are they benefiting from the service? All right, Nathan, do you want to answer the question of uh, the respite stay? We stay one night. So the kind of, and just going back to the one emergency question too, so there's paperwork that's involved. We, you know, we unfortunately wouldn't be able to just admit someone in an emergency situation or even a respite situation just due to needing orders from a PCP or some physician. So we need to know medications, we need to know history, different diagnoses, things of that nature. So getting that picture will help us be able to provide that care. But we do offer a respite. Um, that is one benefit you guys do have as well. And really just trying to coordinate that as much in advance as possible will help all parties out. But really it's a matter of getting that history and physical within a 30 day window. So once I have that history and physical, we can admit to the center within 30 days. But once we get outside that 30 day window, that's when I have to get a, there's a new history and physical that needs to be completed at that point. Because again, medications change, um, you know, different things are going on. So we just need updated information and make sure that that person's appropriate and we can provide the care that's needed. So if you've been to the doctor within the last 30 days, they'll do the HMP, it's called history and physical, and that's the main paperwork that we need to be able to admit to the assisted living or the NRC in, in a situation like that. Um, another question that came up was, and, and, and this is a specific question about two PD. Sorry. Yes, Ms. Ogden, question back there. Thank you. I need to clarify clinic nurse an independent living nurse. Which one are we directing this to? That's, that's the same. There's, there's an independent living clinic nurse is the name of the position. <laughs> so uh, right now, Janice. it's Janice right now. Yes, ma'am. And so we would go to her with our problem? Yes, she's the, name, the nurse for independent living. Yeah, Thank we call it the clinic. Yeah, I think the name is I, independent living clinic nurse, uh, the full title. So yes, same person. Thank you. Thank you. More look this time. Any more questions on that? If not, <laughs> um, what level of care is required for somebody who has a tube feed? Um, and the you know, what about pureed foods and altered diets in general? So this is again one of those questions that I wish it was easy and it sounds straightforward and, and simple. But um, for the most part, a tube feeding is going to be is going to require a skilled level of care. Skill level of care can be provided mostly in the NRC, but you know there is a situation right, that's not going to cover 100% of the cases. That could be uh, something that could be provided in other settings uh, if it meets certain criteria. The different diets, pureed different diets too. That is again that re that that to me leads to the next question: Why is somebody in a pureed diet, and are there other factors influencing that? One factor alone won't say that this is why you need to move. It's all a starting point to a discussion of what is going on with this particular situation, with this case, so that we can make sure that they're safe, so I make sure we have all the services uh, that they need in order to stay independent or in the best level of care. Anything to add from the panel on that? Any questions? Okay. I'm sure there's more questions that... Uh, you know, but it is right about three o'clock, so that's the time we have for the meeting here today. Uh, we're happy to stick around here, answer more questions in, individually. Uh, come see us after this, or any more. But uh, any final thoughts? Yes. Um, a couple, couple questions. Final. Um, can you just
Okay. The question here for anybody that didn't hear is any changes that this year, any changes to the criteria levels of care this year? Um, let me see, I don't think I have it noted here, but it's, uh, we just added a little, we haven't changed any of the assessments. We added a little more detail on some of the questions for independent living. Um, so uh, we added more things like if they have a mobility device, it wasn't uh, added on that earlier. So now we have, if you have a mobility device, but you're able to be independent, that counts as independent. Um, I think that was interaction. Too, but, uh, and then uh, final question. Mm -hmm. There's a few The, the residents provide them. They enter this mechanism. A resident could have many different providers. Correct. So you can define what the residents are providing. Yeah. 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 Um, but you also have other providers, outside specialists, uh, you know, if you have a cardiologist, an orthopedic surgeon, depending on what's going on, those are all providers. Uh, to, yeah, to my sequence, they're all providers. And, and, and depending on what it is. Yes, of course. So all medical opinions will be part of, the, part of the full spectrum of what's going on with each resident. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. There was, again, more under medication management, it was the same um, situation before. You just said, be able to manage your medication safely. So we've added some more verbiage, verbiage to it to say that, in, you know, if you have assistance and, and, and examples on dialysis, colostomy, if you can handle that on your own, um, yeah, then more clarifications. But no, no changes in the process itself. It just, uh, again, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a starting point. It's a... We don't use this every single time. It's just to help us. It's just part of the equation as we go through it. I have two questions. If you're in the NRC recovering from something, can you get a f physician of your choice to take care of you? The question is, if you are in the NRC recovering, can you get the physician of your choice to take care of you? So it is similar to the hospital. We have physicians that are credentialed and have privileges to come through our facility. Um, and that is, you know, we have two physicians right now for that. So you have your option, that is Dr. Draper. Um, and thank you, Dr. Culkin, I was having a moment up here. Um, and those are the two physicians that we have. Dr. Draper is our, attend our medical director and attending physician, so majority have that. If you have an outside physician, they typically don't come into the facility to round and write orders, but you can go to them you can go to appointments, we help you arrange for appointments with them, and they would write um, what's called recommendations. They still need to go through the physician that we have here. And, and that is a, a good point because sometimes a, a cardiologist, you know, they're experts in cardiology and they may, have, they, may just, they may not have the entire picture of what's going on with you as a as pulmonologist. And, and so many people have different specialists. Uh, or even your PCP may not be up to date on a day-to-day -day what's going on there. So, uh, everything does have to go through the attending physician that we have credential through Brandon Oaks that knows our procedures and, and our policies. Right. And you had a second question with that? Yes. Uh, referring to your dementia unit, no matter how badly the person deteriorates, can they still be kept there? So the question is about the memory support unit yeah. uh, that we have Shenandoah. Uh, that is licensed as an assisted living facility under the Department of Social Services regulations. So no, if it gets to the point where somebody needs a full assistance mechanical lift to get to the nursing level of care, uh, yeah, they wouldn't qualify for assistance. There's, there could be a point where they don't meet that criteria anymore, and they would, be, they would have to move to the, the next level of care, which is the NRC. So it's all in the same building, just oh, okay. a different unit, right. and we'll be able to take well, care of anybody. Some, 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 some tragically, some people get very violent at the end stage of dementia, and can they, can they be kept there? Do you have to be shipped out somewhere else? So, yeah, if anybody's a danger to themselves or others, that is something that we would have to uh, have outside help with and, and, and address each, again, each situation is a little different. 
Um, but hopefully, we, most of the times what happens is they would end up going somewhere else, get stabilized and get maybe specialty psychiatrist services and then be able to come back. Uh, okay. And there'll be a situation there. Hi, I had a question about the um, uh, outside doctors and the uh, attending physician and everything. How does that work in a situation like hospice with medical director of hospice writing the orders and that sort of thing? Or is that another topic of discussion altogether? <laughs> that's fine, no, that's fine. So yes, when you have hospice, if somebody's under hospice care, hospice does have their own physicians and their own medical directors, and in, in a way it's a similar. Way. Hospice does come in to the facility, and they're much more involved with that, and they may be able to, to direct the orders a little more involved, so then the primary physician would not be. Uh, so you're saying that the physician for Brandon Oaks then would not be overriding the medical director of hospices, uh, medication orders, and things like that? Yes, that, that is correct. I mean, the physician. Great. Most, that's, yeah. that's there's, now, there's always a caveat, right? There's always a something exceptional if there's a medication that we cannot provide. So I don't want to say that's 100% okay. of the times, but 99.9% .9 of the time, the physicians will talk to each other if there is a discrepancy and that's, they, they will work. They that's will a work, great yeah. improvement. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Yes, our agreements, and we work with, with Good Sam Hospice is the one we work with the most. We have Corellian and the medicine stuff, so we have an agreement with them, and it's all spelled out about who's, you know, how, how that's delineated, so yes, ma'am. All right, well, thank you for coming here today. I hope you have a good Friday afternoon.